I'm thankful for the scars. It's like those scars are singing a song. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. We're talking about several things, and today, uh, through the summer, we've been looking at great things mentioned in the Bible, and today we're going to focus on uh, God's great love. And uh, God's great love is agape love. Now, I put the Greek word up there because I know you can all read Greek, but that's just a, so you know that it really is. That's what it says in the Greek New Testament, agape love. There's another word for love, is called phileo, and phileo love is brotherly love. We get that in the word Philadelphia. Uh, we find that word. But agape love is a word that's used almost exclusively, or, or when, when God speaks of his love, it's always this agape love. It's a self-sacrificing, uh, it's a unconditional, it's a I love you even if you don't love me back. I, I, it's that kind of love. It's just a powerful, powerful love, and it's a great love. It's a great love. Jesus says to his disciples in John 15, 9, Now remain in my love. Isn't that interesting? You see, I found myself in the love of Jesus the day I accepted him as my Savior for my sins. I was basking in that love. That was a wonderful moment. I wrote home to my mom about it. I wrote on a postcard because I was at camp. It said, Mom, yesterday I shot guns and got 21 points. I was at camp, all right? I'll write a letter later this week. I misspelled letter. It was only one T in it. <laughs> and uh, I said, yeah, uh, yesterday I shot guns. I got 21 points. I'll write a letter later this week. I bought the postcard because she sent me this envelope with all this stationery, and I knew I couldn't fill that up. <laughs> but I could fill up that little tiny spot. And so I was writing this out. And then I wrote the next line that I wrote down, yesterday I got staved. <laughs> I was not a good speller then. I'm not a good speller now. Thank you, Lord, for spell check. <laughs> staved. Later I would learn that a stave is a board. A lumber companies are called stave companies. They take the wood and they make stave planks out of them. I didn't know I was such a theologian at eight years old that yesterday I got staved. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Amen? I got staved. I was nailed to the cross with Jesus. He took my sins. My sin was put to his account, his righteousness to my account. Why? Because he loved me. That moment I was so excited, I wrote that home to my mom. My mom saved it, and I still have it. I have that. It's one of my treasured possessions. I had such a joy in my heart that my sins were forgiven. You know what he says here? Now remain in my love. Every year on September 15th, I get a phone call from a friend. His name is Russell Slate. And Russell Slate calls me to thank me for the day. I shared my faith with him, and he accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior from his sins. I've told you about Russell before, because Russell... As soon as he finished praying the sinner's prayer, jumped up and down. I mean, he was lit in my office. He's the only guy ever jumping up and down in my office. I thought maybe something had been connected to that chair that gave him a little jolt. He's jumping up and down. He said, my sins are forgiven. And I said, wow, no one has ever... That man still has that same joy. He remains in the love of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The Ephesian church left the first love. That's what it says in the book of Revelation. They had left their first love. We don't want to leave our first love. We want to remain in it. So what is this thing about love? Jesus says, greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. That's why we sang about the scars. Jesus laid down his life for us. God demonstrated his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus says, greater love. I've been talking about great things. This is greater. This is greater than great. Greater love has no one this than a man lay down his life for his friends. Now, how can you tell if you are remaining in his love? That's what I want to talk about today. 
How can you tell if you are remaining in his love? Is it a feeling? Oh, I feel just so wonderful. You know, when a, a young man and a young lady meet each other and they make that eye contact and they get that little flush look on their face and then they make their first words contact and they get that butterfly feeling on the inside, I think it's technically called limerence. It only lasts, that, that butterfly feeling, that gaga, that ooey gooey feeling, it only lasts for a year. That's it. If it lasts longer than a year, then you're just not normal. That's all that lasts. That's why you really want people to date longer than a year so they can get past that all, that, all that artificial stuff. We call it puppy love and get to the real thing, the real thing. Because you know that feeling goes away because love is not just a feeling. And especially God's love. God's love is not a feeling. God's love, agape love, is a choice. It's a choice. It's primarily choice. I'm not saying there's no feelings involved in that, but it's a choice. He chose to love you. We'll see that later in the passage. He chose to love you. Not when you were wonderful and lovely and said, wow, I better pick him because he's the best. God demonstrated his love towards us while we were yet sinners. We were the worst of the lot. It was a choice to make us the objects of his love, his goodness, his kindness, his grace, his mercy, to give us eternal life. It was his choice. It's not primarily a feeling. Love is a choice that is evidenced. There are evidences for it. There is evidence of love. And the passage said, remain in my love. And the question is, am I remaining in God's love? How do I know if I'm remaining in His love if I don't feel it? I got saved when I was eight years old. I told you, I wrote that postcard home to my mom. I have not felt saved every day. <laughs> it would be a lie to say that I do. It's a matter of fact. He loved me, and that is a matter of fact. And there should be evidence in my life that I am remaining or abiding. I'm inside his love. And some of those evidences are found in our passage today. In John chapter 15, verse 9, remain in my love. Verse 10, he says, obey. You will know that you're remaining in his love if you're obeying the Lord. You're obeying him. Now, I know modern weddings don't have the word obey in them anymore. In the old times, they did. When my mom and dad were married years and years ago, they had the word obey in there. So when they renewed their wedding vows at their 50th anniversary, I was renewing them in their behalf. Church was filled with guests and friends. I, before the service, I went to my mom and I said, Hey, mom, for $50, I'll switch the vows and put in there that he has to obey you. <laughs> She chuckled and laughed. <laughs> Obey is a real part of love. If you love someone, you obey their wishes, their commands, not because you've got to, because you want to. You want to make that other person happy. You want their highest good. So, so, so you obey. In this heart, I got those famous verses. We claim to be a Jesus-built church, built on the great confession that Jesus is the Christ, built on the great commandment. Here's the great commandment. And then there's the great commission, go into all the world and preach the gospel. But this is the great commandment. They came to Jesus and said, what, was, what is the greatest of all commandments? And Jesus replied, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. I call this worship. Isn't that what worship's all about? You bow down before the Lord. You just say, Lord, I love you. I love you. When Jesus said, if you obey my commandments, you're remaining in my love. He's saying, listen, I loved you. And now you, if you're going to be reigning in my love, you're going you're to love me back by obeying my commandments. Not because you got to. You really want to. You really want to. Does that make sense? The second part of the verse and this is uh, the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You will love your neighbor as yourself. In the Luke account, we're told of the same verses, similar situation. And Jesus said, the, the, the guy was tempting Jesus to find out 
well, what it means to be your neighbor. So, well, who is my neighbor? Trying to get off the hook here. That maybe I don't have to love everybody. And so Jesus tells them a story. There was a certain man going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and some thugs got him along the way. They beat him up, took all of his stuff. You know, they, they took everything he had, they stripped him, and uh, they left him beat up on the side of the road. And along comes the Levite, and he's on his donkey, and he's cranking along as fast as a donkey will go. And he, you know what happens when there's an accident on the side of the road. All the traffic slows up. Get a good eyeful, you know. Hey, as soon as you see how bad it is, then you speed up. You keep kicking that donkey and away he goes. Along comes a priest, man. He's on his double-humped camel, and he's in a good gallop. Whoa, baby, he slows that thing down. He looks again. Oh, yeah, it's a bloody mess. Kicks him, and away he goes. You know the story. Along comes a Samaritan. Now, Samaritans are half-breeds, half-Jewish, half-Gentiles. They're hated by the Jews. Jews hate them. The enemy. Here, the Levite and the priest, who are probably either going to do their priestly duty and their Levitical duty in Jerusalem, or they were leaving from it. It's like going to church or leaving from church, and they don't have time for the person in need because I don't know that guy. But a Samaritan, the despised enemy, comes along this Jew on the side of the road, and the text says he has compassion. The word compassion is falkna. It's a feeling that you get way deep down in your gut, a gut feeling. He's moved with compassion. He, heal, he, he, he stops and he fixes the man. He puts him on his donkey, takes him to a, an inn. He tells the innkeeper there, hey, take care of him. And anything, anything that he needs, I'm going to be gone for a couple of days, but I'll come back and I'll pay for it. I'll pay. And Jesus looked at him and said, now, which one of those three was the man's neighbor? First time I ever preached this was at the First Baptist Church Pontiac when I was on pastoral staff there and I was preaching and uh, I preached the sermon on this and uh, as I was, the um, sermon was over, left the church, we had an evening service. So I'm driving to the church for the evening service and I'm a little late and if you know me, I'm a clock watcher. And uh, this is driving me nuts, I'm a little late and the traffic is backed up in the lane I need to be in but I think if I gun it, I can get around everybody. And so I did, man, I gunned it. I whipped over in the left lane, I gunned it, and I'm zipping down in 59, and just as I'm coming to the church, I swerve over, but I see the guy, you know, just like these. I look over, and the guy that's holding everything up is driving on a flat tire. The truth is, there's very little rubber left. Sparks are flying off the wheel. And I say in my head, what an idiot. He's ruined the wheel. So I whip it into the parking lot, and this guy behind me, he finally gets to the same driveway, and he whips it into the parking lot. I park my car, get out, he pulls in right next to me. Well, I had pulled in next to my brother Dave, who had just arrived to church a little bit before me. And so uh, as soon as I get out of the car, my brother Dave says to him, give him your spare tire. And I'm thinking... Uh-oh, good Samaritan. I just preached this that morning. Give him my spare tire. And I'm thinking for myself, easy for you to say. I said, Dave, what if it doesn't match? He said, oh, no, no, no. My brother was in the body repair business. <laughs> your spare and his, his tire, they match. Give him your spare tire. I said, what? Easy for him to say. I'm going to be driving around without a spare tire. I'll pop my trunk, but I'm thinking, good Samaritan. I'm not doing this because I love this guy. I'm doing this to save face in front of my brother because I talked about the good Samaritan, right? So I give the guy to help him. I jack up his car, help him. My brother and I were putting my spare tire in it. This is my spare tire. The guy, all done, he doesn't even say thanks. He backs out, drives away with my spare tire. 
I go in, I have an evening service to do, I preach the evening service, I go out and I get in the car and say, now what if I get a flat? <laughs> My brother Dave calls me the next day and says, hey, don't worry. We got plenty of those spare tires. He said, we get cars in here totaled all the time. We got them just laying around. He said, I'll give you one. Swing by and pick it up. But you know how our minds work? This is going to cost me something. You see, real love Jesus is talking about cost you something. His love cost him his life. He expects your love to cost you something for your neighbor when you see him in need. Whatever need you see. Well, I'm only at my first point. We've got to hustle along here. <laughs> Another way we know that we remain in his love is that we obey his commands, but also we rejoice. You rejoice. I have told you this so that my joy, we're talking about God's joy, Jesus' joy, may be in you and that your joy might be complete. Now remember the, in the psalm, Psalm 51, David said, Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Some of us need that. We need to be restored to the joy we had the day we accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior and our sins were forgiven and we have that rush within us that just overwhelmed us. I have peace with God. He's forgiven my sins. I have eternal life. We need to have that restored to us. And when I think about that whole idea of the being restored, the person who was lost and found, I think of that story Jesus told about the man that had a hundred sheep. The sheep really represents the people. And the shepherd, when he found, notices that one of his sheep is missing, he leaves the 90 and 9 and he goes after that one. Why? Because he loves his sheep. And he goes until he finds it. And when he finds it, he brings it back on his shoulders. It says he's rejoicing. What's he do? He throws a party. He tells his friends, listen, rejoice with me. My sheep that was lost is now found. You know, my friend Russell, he rejoices every day that I was a lost sheep and I am found. It would change all of our lives if we were to remain in his love in such a way that every morning we got up and we said, I'm loved by Jesus Christ. Wow. The rest of your day, you just have to go much better than it would if you just got up and went on your own way. He rejoiced. Listen, the way you know you're remaining in the love of Jesus is that you reciprocate. My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Listen, love each other. Normally, the word for reciprocal love is phileo. It's like a brotherly love. I love you and you love me back. I love you, you love me back. You know, I do something for you, you do it back for me. I loan you something, you loan me something when I need it. And we have this reciprocal relationship. And the word is phileo. Phileo. But here he doesn't choose phileo, he says agape each other. What is that? That is like what I've done for you, I've sacrificed for you. He says, as I have loved you. Jesus in order, just a, just a, a day or so before he's telling them this, he says to, to the disciples, in order to show the full extent of his love, Jesus took a towel and he wrapped it around his waist and he went to each of the disciples and he washed their feet. You know what it is? It's service. He's serving them. My command is for you to love each other so that you serve one another. It's not about somebody serving me. It's all about how can I serve you. It's like, how can I outserve you? Imagine what the church would be like if everybody tried to outserve each other. Man, that would be a great place to be. It would be a great place to be. He says, as I have loved you, you see, Jesus hadn't yet gone to the cross, so he couldn't say, he could have said, as I'm going to love you. But for us who live on the other side of the cross, we can say, as I have loved you. How do you love me? This much! As he stretched out his arms, suspended between heaven and earth, having his soul being made an offering for sin, paying in full the price of our sin, the debt we owed, crying out, to tell us die in the Greek. It is finished, paid in full. 
kind of like that good Samaritan. Whatever it costs for him to get well, put it on my tab. Put it on my tab. My commandment is this, that you love each other as I have loved you. Then we come to the verse that says it's so great. Greater love has no man than this, no one, that he lay down his life for his friends. He lays down his life for his friends. The man that led me to the Lord used John 3.16, my favorite verse. For God so loved the world that he gave. The man that led me to the Lord put my name in there. For God so loved Dennis that he gave his one and only son. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus said, no man takes my life from me, but I freely lay it down. You see... You remain in that sacrificial love. I would imagine most of us know John 3.16. Let me just do it quick. How many have memorized John 3.16? All right, yeah, see, most of us have memorized. Most memorized verse in the Bible. I challenge you to memorize 1 John 3.16 too. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Whoa. You know what I'm saying? You love as I love. That's what Jesus is saying. I laid my my, my life down for you when you were unlovely. At least you could lay down your life for those that are in the family. We all lay down our lives for our brothers. I don't know. I keep stepping on that, I think. Or Lord, you got something more for me to say. (laughs) It is very rare in life that you have a friend who loves you so much that they will die for you. I often, and I've told you this before, I love my brother. My brother Dave, my brother Jerry, I love my brothers. I love my brother Ed. My brother Dave, I used to tease though and say, brother, I love you so much. If you needed a kidney, I'd give you one of mine, but it makes sure it's the one with the stones in it. (laughs) Honest to goodness though, do you have a friend for whom you would die? That's pretty powerful. I mean, Jesus is very, very powerful here. He, he's really hitting, hitting us where we live. Do you have a friend that you believe would really die for you? This is what the church community is supposed to be. Do you realize why the church in the early centuries exploded with growth? They were a group of people who were willing to die for each other. Who didn't want to be in that group that everybody there said they love me so much they'd risk their life for me? You want to be in that group. When we show that kind of love, we cannot help but grow. But as long as we're on our double hump camel, oh, gawking, or we're on that slow donkey, oh, we're gawking, we're just looking it over. Don't, yep, hey, you know what I imagine they said? I'll pray for you, buddy. <laughs> Not stopping, helping, paying. It's sacrificial. It's sacrificial. The next thing I see in this context where it says, if you want to remain in his love, you need to befriend. You are my friends, he says. Abraham was called a friend of God. Don't you want to be called the friend of Jesus? You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants because a servant does not know what his master business is. In Genesis 18, God, speaking with his friend Abraham, uh, he says to the other two angels there with him, uh, he says to them, Shall I hide anything from Abraham? <laughs> 
You see, friends are an open book. While doing research some years ago, I came across the fact that it's very easy for us to talk about our past. It is very easy to talk about our past. In fact, you get a group of guys together to kind of out top each other in the stories, the things they've done in the past. And sometimes we even embellish them so that they sound even better than they were, okay? It's easy to talk about the past because nothing changed. There's no threat there. A little harder to talk about the present, what I'm doing, because that then starts to reveal me right now. It's really hard to talk about the future, what I will do, because then I'll be accountable. Everybody here is going to say, oh, hey, did you do what you said you're going to do? So we have a real hard time talking about that. But friends talk about the past, the present, the future. They open up like a book and they they're let, let their whole life be read. That's a friend. You see, most of us have acquaintances. And we tell stories about our past. We don't tell them what's going on right now in the moment. And we don't talk about the future. We don't talk about our aspirations, our goals, because we only have acquaintances. Jesus said, you're not just acquaintances. You're not just my servants. You're not just here to, to perform tasks. You are my friends because I have called you friends. Everything that I have learned from my Father, I have made known to you. I'm an open book. I'm telling you it all. He's even been predicting his death and they're not getting it. It's going over their head. But he's telling them because he's their friend. Jesus wants to be your friend for you to remain in his love and be his friend so that he's opening his heart to you from the scriptures and you're opening your heart back to him in your daily life. That's how you remain in his love. You remain in his love. And then there's this one. To be fruitful. To be fruitful. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit. John will later write in his uh, first epistle uh, that the Lord loves us. We love him because he first loved us. Before I ever loved him, he loved me because he loved me with an everlasting love, Jeremiah 33, 3. But he chose me to bear fruit. Not because I was already fruitful, but in order to bear fruit. To bear fruit. Actually, this whole passage started with this fruit-bearing idea. Jesus said, I am the true vine. My Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes it away. And every branch in me that bears fruit, he prunes it that it might bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Remain or abide in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can you except you abide in me. I am the, bran I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If a man does not abide in the vine, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into a fire and they're burned. But if a man abides in me and my words abide in him, he can ask whatever he will and it will be done unto him. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. John 15, 1 through 8. Then he tells us, John 15, 9, remain in my love. You see, to bear fruit, and the fruit here, I think he's speaking of the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, all produced by the Holy Spirit, all come from being vitally connected to Jesus Christ. If a branch is broken off, it's withered and it's good for nothing. Most of us come on a Sunday, we're grafted in, we're in the vine. We're, we're producing and then, then something happens Monday, Tuesday or Wednesday, we get cracked off and we come back to church on Sunday hoping that somehow I get grafted back in. He's saying remain in the vine. Remain in the love that you bear much fruit. 
Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. That's powerful stuff there. That's powerful stuff. The seventh thing I have is just, uh, just do it. He repeats this. He's already said, this is my command. You love each other. Love each other. He said it twice in the passage. Love one another. Love one another. Now, here's what we're left with after we go through this passage. This is what I'm left with. Jesus commands us to love one another just as he loved us. That's sacrificial, folks. It's going to cost me something. That's really hard for some more than others. Why is that harder for some than more than others? Well, I got political differences with so and so. Here I'm a strict conservative and they're a bleeding liberal. Or I'm a bleeding liberal and they're a strict conservative. How I, I can't love that person. We have so many things in our culture that divide us, but when we come to this love Jesus is talking about, it doesn't matter if that other person is of a different political perspective. I'm willing to die for my brother in Christ just like Jesus laid down his life for me. That's how I know I remain in his love. I am not remaining in, my, in, in his love if I'm letting different opinions stop me from seeking that person's highest good. And I don't care what it is. It could be race, it could be gender, it could be status, it can be politics, it could, you name it. You seek that other's highest good. Even, and the more difficult it is, the more I think the Lord just smiles and says, oh, my blessing's going to be upon you. If you can do that to your worst enemy. <laughs> you see, in, in Romans 5, when it said God demonstrated his love toward us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The next verse talks about how we were enemies of God, but now we are justified. We were enemies. Uh, we had declared war on God. It said they were, they were against everything against God, but God just bestowed his love on us. Bestowed his love on us. Jesus commands us to love one another, and that is harder for some than for others. Love is more than a feeling, folks. That's what I'm trying to say. You can love someone you, when you don't feel like it. And you know how that is in a marriage. There are times when <laughs> your spouse is not the loveliest person in the world. And you don't throw the marriage out the window. You tough it through that and you choose, you choose to love that person in spite of what they've done or their idiosyncrasies, the things that you used to think are cute and are now totally annoying. You just choose to love that person. Love is more than a feeling. It's obedience. And so I want to leave you with this. Love one another. Who? Your neighbor. Who? That idiot driving on the steel rim of his tire, shooting sparks down the road. Whoever has a need, you love them. And you will remain in his love. Let's pray. Father in heaven, this is your word. It speaks to us today. Greater love has no one than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. Remain in that love. Help us, Lord. Not just talk about it, but remain in it. Remain in it. Obey your word. Bear fruit. Do the things of your word. This we ask, O oh Lord, that you would enable us by your spirit to love you back. In Jesus' name, amen.